All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we have a couple of uh, returners here with us this evening. They've, they've been uh, uh, presenting uh, in the past with us and uh, just want to give them a very big thank you for coming back and their willingness to, to help us out with these webinars. Uh, we have Michael Reichman and Scott Aronowitz uh, with us this evening. Um, so, gentlemen, thank you uh, for taking the time out of your schedule and busy schedules for being uh, with us tonight to do this. Thank you to all of you who have joined us this evening. Uh, we appreciate you uh, joining us. Also want to give a quick shout out to Carlton Dill, uh, Bob McKinney, uh, again, Michael Reichman, and Sam Maroon. Uh, they actually revised uh, this seven uh, person mechanics for the upcoming school year um, as it was uh, a little bit outdated in the years. And, and that was one item that was brought up this past uh, mm -hmm. fall. Uh, advisory um, officials uh, meeting that came up. And, and so this group took the lead in uh, reviewing that. So thank you, gentlemen, for, for doing that for us. Um, as previously, uh, please use the uh, Q&A box uh, down below. Uh, as questions uh, arise throughout the presentation, I will monitor those and, and um, ask our presenters uh, those questions uh, at a fitting time. Um, so without further ado, uh, Michael Scott, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you for being here tonight. Appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Jeremy, and uh, very happy to be with everybody this evening to uh, go over seven man mechanics. As Jeremy mentioned, um, our officials advisory committee group, we've spent quite a bit of time um, going through this kind of line by line um, and discussing and making sure that what we have matches up with the CAA manual, for example. And so everyone uh, in the state is on the same page. Um, but before we begin, just to uh, reintroduce myself, uh, I'm the vice president of the Sunshine Football Officials Association here in Pinellas County, Clearwater area. Uh, and I've been on the Officials Advisory Council um, for the last few years. In fact, my term will be uh, coming to an end uh, this month. So it's been a, an honor to represent everyone in section three, uh, but really to kind of carry the torch for all of our football officials. Um, but I'd like to introduce uh, Scott Aronowitz, who uh, kind of has dual citizenship between uh, our association here in Pinellas County and North Florida. So Scott. Hey, thanks, Mike. Thanks everyone for, show for coming tonight. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a real honor for me to be involved with FHS, FHSA. I've done a few webinars in the past and it's always a pleasure and honor to, come, to be asked back. I've been uh, an evaluator with SFOA for what, three years now, I believe. And uh, they're doing a lot of good things. Been with NFOA for about 15 years since I moved down here. And um, again, we're trying to get consistency throughout the state and hopefully we uh, this, this will go a long way. Yeah, and uh, just to kind of level set with our presentation, we, we've scheduled an hour. Um, this presentation is about 65 slides. Uh, we're not going to cover every slide tonight. Um, there's some best practices in here, some talking points. Um, so our takeaway for all of you from the very beginning, um, Jeremy will post this out on the Central Hub after tonight. Um, review this within your crews, review it within your association. Again, there'll be some things that we will pass over just due to time constraints so we can focus on uh, items that we felt are a little bit more important that deserve discussion. So um, please forgive us if we don't necessarily touch on a topic or a question you may have about that tonight, uh, but I encourage everyone to go download the presentation after the call. Uh, so you can review it, review it within your groups, for your associations, and I encourage all of you to um, make this part of your individual trainings within your associations. So Scott, I will uh, turn it back to you to kick us off with uh, our purpose. Great. Thanks, Mike. So, so why do we have seven-person mechanics? And I preface that by saying that obviously statewide we're using seven-person mechanics. Um, I think it's extremely helpful for all the local associations to incorporate a few, at least a few seven person games during the regular season. SFOA among others has, is going to do that this coming year. Quite frankly, I've been trying to get NFOA to do that in Jacksonville. Uh, there's been some pushback, um, but I think it's beneficial. Um, so why do, why do we have seven person mechanics? There are more eyes on the players, especially in the dead ball period, including in the pregame. 
when we're out on the field, um, you know, we want to be able to watch players. We want to make sure we know where um, opponents are located, when they're coming out, where and when they're coming out of the locker room. The more eyes we have in that situation, the better. Because as you'll see, referee and the umpire have certain duties, which leaves five officials to monitor the field. And the five person, we, you know, we, when we do that, we're down to three. So more eyes on the players in a dead ball period. Uh, reduces the likelihood of miscounts and substitution issues. So we have our, our deep three that count the defense, right? Referee and umpire and uh, count the offense, all right? So it leaves the line of scrimmage officials to do their business without having the burden of counting. Doubles the number of sideline managers. Sideline management is always an important topic for us. And now you have two deep wings that are, that are helping rather than uh, a short wing a line scrimmage official having to spot the ball, put a beam bag down, get out of bounds and manage uh, the team areas, team benches. Now you have a partner to do that down the field. Uh, allows officials to stay with their keys, provide information on blocks, et cetera. So we have better angles. Okay, If you have a, a block in the back and your partner comes and says, you know, I saw that it was in the side. Let's pick that up. Okay, Something we might not have in a five person. Uh, it should translate to overall game management, which is really what we were getting at here. And let me talk about game management real quick. We're going to talk about how to do a coin toss and all that uh, all that stuff that the that that is on these powerpoints. Um, I'll take a good game good game management over that any day. And when I and when I say that, you could have the best coin toss in the world, best coin coin, coin toss mechanics in the world. If a fight breaks out during your game. No one's going to remember your coin toss mechanics. On the flip side, you can have the worst coin toss mechanics in, in the world. And if you manage your game uh, to the closest of perfection that we that we want, again, no one's going to remember your coin toss mechanics. And you should eliminate ball watching. We're trying to do, we, we and I'd say we across the board, we're terrible with ball watching, all right? Uh, to the detriment of, missing blindside blocks and things like that right we were, we're we're great ball watchers but we're bad player watchers so the bigger more set of sets of eyes should should eliminate ball watching now does this all translate to more or fewer fouls it all depends right you want uh to get the the unnecessary roughnesses the late hits out of bounds you want to watch the players and get get the unsportsman likes that we might not get in a five person system all right. There are some coaches um, that, from what I understand, that don't like the seven person mechanics during the regular season because they said it translates to more fouls. It may or may not. But um, now that everybody who wants to be in the playoffs is going to encounter seven person uh, crews, what's the difference? That's that's what I have to say. OK. All right, um, here's the general pregame mechanics timing, assuming a 7.30 kickoff, which most of our playoff games are. Again, if you're working uh, a regular season game, let's say at six o'clock, like they are in Duval County, or some other places start at 6.30 or seven, adjust accordingly. So about 45 minutes before the game, we take the field in uniform, at least two officials monitor the buffer zone, uh, 45 yard to 45 yard line buffer zone. Um, up to prior to seven o'clock, you want to get the coach referee umpire meeting completed. Um, you leave the field when the visiting, if the visiting team leaves the field. All right. Um, if only the home team leaves and the visiting team stays, stay with them because we want to prevent a situation where they're defacing the logo. For example, we, I've seen that before. All right. Uh, at seven o'clock, the side judge is going to talk to the game clock operator. Now, uh, generally, it's someone on, on your crew. So you probably will have already had that talk. And same thing with the play clock operator, uh, the back judge. Sometimes you get to a field, you know, since someone's not assigned to the play clock or game clock, you got to have that conference. But the, this stuff should, should be done already. Of course, you're going to have the chain crew, all right? The headline linesman and line judge talk to the chain crew. And then the field judge and side judge talk to the uh, ball people. Again, there's no set way that you have to do that. That's all up to you. Um, 
about five minutes before kickoff, field judge and side judge should have their respective captains at the 50 yard line. So um, whatever sideline you're on, ref, referee and umpire will enter the field together from the press box side and go, these are, these are estimates, right? Sometimes we have to deal with the band playing the national anthem and so on and so forth. These are just estimates. The headlinesmen and line judge are responsible for bringing their teams to the field. Home team should enter first, followed by the visiting team. Hopefully they are entering from different uh, areas, but if not, those are other things that need to be considered. Might need more staffing on those. Coin toss, uh, side judge, field judge, escort captains to the numbers. Okay, and uh, interesting that we allot three minutes for, for the coin toss. It shouldn't even take that long. And then at 7.30, we kick off. All right. Okay. Um, when we get to the field, all right, the referee and umpire will go talk to the coaches. Um, and then the remaining five will walk the field okay, to make sure there are no imperfections uh, and that the sidelines are clear. All right. A lot of teams bring equipment. They bring media, the uh, you know, their computers and, and things like that, their, their screens, make sure all that stuff is uh, away from the playing area. All right, pregame duties, all right. Referee and umpire visit with the head coaches before the game, very brief. We're not gonna talk about that uh, in too much detail. Every, every crew is different. Every referee and umpire uh, have different styles, that's fine. Um, everybody else, as I said, walk the field. Okay, and we, we talked about that, so on and so forth. Okay, every now to the extent that everybody is is done with their pregame duties, it's important to monitor the players. All right, so we don't need trash talking between uh, the teams prior to that. That's why we have the staffing that we do. Okay, um, I'm not going to get too much into the specifics of what the 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 staff should to tell the ball handlers and the and the Chain crew, again, that's for a different topic. We're just telling you what, what your duties are. And we can we could skip over this. This is all stuff, all that stuff is are things we should be doing, whether it's five or seven. Okay. So this is generally what we want to uh, do for our pregame while the referee and umpire are doing their duties. And uh, the Line judge, field judge should be having the conversation with the chain crew at a different time. Uh, not the line judge, the line judge head linesman should have their conversation at a different time from the field judge and side judge so we can have more eyes on, on the players. Okay, again, get your teams on the field three minutes before the start of each half. All right, if both teams are out, you've done your job. But if, if not, and you gotta go get them, Make sure they're there, ready to go, um, at least in, in anticipation for the coin toss being completed. All right, we're going to go through the coin toss, referee and umpire, go to the middle. Okay. Deep wings bring their teams in. All right. Once you reach the hash, you go, this is all straightforward stuff. Again, I'm not going to lose sleep if nobody does that exactly the way it's written here. All right. There are more important things for us to worry about. All right. So we've done the coin toss. We've gotten the proper football. We all meet in the middle. Somebody tells a joke and we run to our positions. And now we're ready for kickoff. Okay. Back judge hands the, is going to hand the ball to the kicker. All right, whenever, when he's ready, he's gonna go to the Keen K's restraining line on the press box side. And now we've got four officials boxing in the neutral zone and we've got three officials on the goal line. Question so far, does, there's a question in the, uh, in the chat. Yeah, Questions? there was one. Um, it was regarding how does FTSA feel about wing switching sides after halftime? Uh, I have a, a message into to Robbie just to make sure I'm accurate as well on, on that. So 
Okay. Um, from my end, as far as switching, if that's what associations want to do, um, we know some some scenarios call for that, whether they're um, a coach is really on an official and they just need to get those two uh, apart from each other. We do know there's some some situations that call from that and we want what's best for the game. If that's what's going to make the game flow smoother and calm the nerves or calm the situation of, of everybody's um uh current state um we have no problems with that if the associations want to roll with hey you're sticking to each side that's fine as well um but let me get in uh, uh see what robbie says as well um but for my end that's how i see it i'd rather the game be played smooth uh and and if someone has to switch because of that reason like that uh, or another scenario that may come up like that i'm i'm totally for it as long as the association um allows that i, I don't want to go against any um local uh i don't say rules but local guidance that they've given but we would allow for something like that if they're if, if that makes it an easier flow yeah um, i think i think it's a good idea personally we do it in college and just gives a fresh face to the to the sideline so there's no you know there's no uh question about favoritism and, and you know sometimes you want to take care of your own sideline i get it so it's i think it's healthy to to switch and then another one would the chains switch also no the chains would stay stay uh, opposite press box so what we do and so i'm getting off a tangent here a little bit in college the head linesman and side judge start on the press box side and they then they go to the other go to there where they normally would be in the second half so the chains would not switch perfect all right those were the two cool all right, make sure we're counting our uh, K players. Okay, the, the all the officials um, in the neutral zone count those, and then the three deep will count the receiving team. The ball's kicked. You'll see the back judge and the umpire come anywhere between the numbers and the hash, okay? with eyes pretty much straight down the middle. Now we could talk about keys and numbers and stuff, but at the end of the day, we're talking about the zones and who really is a threat. And we talk about the people with the brick, okay? Those gunners that are running down, well, they're all gunners, but people running down middle of the field looking to make a hit, okay? And those are the people that could get blocked illegally, blind side, uh, block in the back, et cetera. The back judge and umpire come into the middle immediately at the kick, unless it's an onside kick, and we, then we don't do that. But a deep kick uh, to the middle between the hash and uh, the numbers, they don't have to be symmetrical. If the umpire wants to stay at the numbers, the back judge wants to come to the hash, that's fine. The object is to get the best look possible of, of your players. And Scott, real quick, can you just talk a little bit about, because um, there's some confusion out there. The back judge has goal line responsibility on a kick return. The umpire does not. So can you just speak to what the umpire should do being out there in the middle in the event of a kickoff uh, or return on a kickoff? Yeah, the umpire is just doing what he or she would normally do on a scrimmage play, staying in the middle, watching for blocks, watching anything illegal, just cleaning up the play. I mean, it's really... In general, we're just trying to we're trying to manage the chaos. I mean, kickoffs are chaotic, so we're just trying to 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 look at again. We're not watching the ball. In fact, very few people should be watching the football. We're watching the players. Okay, we're watching for those blocks that that might be questionable. We're watching for the takedowns, the obvious stuff, and the and the obvious stuff, the unsportsmanlike, the uh, unnecessary. Okay, things like that. That's pretty much what, what the umpire does on any given play. That's what he or she will be doing on, on a kick, on a free kick. Okay, let's look at this diagram here. And I, forgive me for the logo in the middle. I borrowed from our neighbors to the north. But here's what we're looking at. We have the, the umpire and um, back judge uh, both in between the numbers and hash okay now as i said they are not symmetrical all right um there's no specific yard line they should be at there's no 
Uh, it's just where are you comfortable? Where can you see all that action right in the middle there? Okay, so just about everybody's eyes are going to be on on this area, and we we see our two um, deep wings. Okay, at around the forty yard line, the minus forty. Right, they are all looking in to that area. Okay, in a zone. Not everybody's looking in right into the middle. Everybody's looking in some kind of zone. Right, but so if 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 you look on the right side of your screen at the forty yard line. That deep wing really has nothing uh, until you until the middle of the field. So there's no reason to watch the football. It's just keep your head on a swivel and just wait for something to pop out at you. Okay, um, referee, you are waiting. Uh, you're what you're on the goal line. Okay, you're going to watch the blocks ahead of the runner. You're going to watch for usually uh, you wouldn't watch for a fair catch on a deep kick here. But anything out of the ordinary, all right? And then the short wings, who are deep in this case, the H and the L, are going to start on the goal line, right on the pilot, all right? And they're going to follow the play, and they're responsible for spotting the ball. And I'll talk about these responsibilities, okay? But we must manage all this chaos right in the middle because that's where uh, any foul we're, are mostly going to occur until the dead ball period. So if we have a player that goes out of bounds, we'll manage that as we would any scrimmage play. All right, questions on this diagram? Okay, all right, so things we need to talk about. Kick off out of bounds. Again, we're not gonna go into rules here because we, we should all know uh, what the options are for kick off out of bounds, uh, <clears throat> review procedures for free kick after safety, all things to consider when we're pre-gaming for kickoffs. Touching by, by K, touching by R. Um, the clock starting on a legal touch, all right? Uh, possession and fouls, status of the ball on fouls. Okay. Illegal blocks, especially Blanca and momentum. We don't see a lot of momentum uh, on free kicks, but they can happen, all right? We gotta be aware of that. Kick catch interference, fair catches on the, on the short kicks. All right, onside kicks and blocking, all right? You are responsible on your side of the ball, all right, for the blocks, all right? Sorry, go back on that. I, I apologize. I misspoke. Okay, um, game officials on the side of the ball is kick, take primary responsibility for the ball, touching, okay? Because what, what we want in general on scrimmage plays, five person, seven person, doesn't matter. You want to get the widest angle possible to see blocks, and that's why the officials opposite, because usually you don't have an onside kick go right down the middle. Okay, it's usually going to be to one side or the other. So we want the the officials on the opposite side of where the kick goes to be responsible for blocks. They can see uh, the wider angle. They can see whether or not the the receiving team are passive in the neutral zone. When I say passive. We all know that the kicking team can't block the receiving team before they're eligible to touch it. Okay, we all agree with that. Um, but we also know that if a receiving team player is coming up to get that ball and engages the kicking team player, we're not going to penalize the kicking team player for blocking. Okay. But if that receiving team player is not looking to engage the kicking team player, then we're going to have a foul for uh, illegal blocking on, on the kicking team. Does that make sense? Okay. <clears throat> Next slide, Mike. Okay. Here's what's important. Here's what's important. Um, referee, headlinesman, and line judge who are on the goal line at the start of the kick. Stay on the goal line until it's no longer threatened, okay? And when I say no longer threatened, it, when, usually when the ball carrier reaches at least the 10 yard line or so. And why is that? Several reasons. Um, if you leave early, the kick is, if all three leave early and the, and the kick is muffed and it goes, near the goal line, we have to have people there to know exactly where it is. Same thing if we leave early and we have a fumble and either a return or a recovery at or near the goal line, we've got to have people on the goal line to, to officiate that, <clears throat> all right? There's no sense in having seven officials if we're not going to be in the best position possible, okay? So it's not, not necessary to leave the goal line prematurely. We should not be doing that, all right? Because all we're doing is 
you know, we're looking beyond the runner anyway for blocks and spotting the ball. Well, just like in a regular scrimmage play, we don't need to get ahead of the runner to do that. So let's be patient, wait till that ball's possessed and wait till that um, runner goes at least to the 10 yard line, okay? Don't leave the, the goal line early. Uh, for all seven officials, the blocks are paramount. The end of the run is not. So if we miss, if, we, if we're not watching, if watching the ball and the ball carrier, all right, we're not as concerned as to whether he's down at the, at the plus 24 or the plus 26, okay? Not where it's going to be first and 10 either way. But if we miss the block that sprung him, that's more important, okay? So we'll get the end of the run. It's not, not the end of the world if we don't get the exact spot at the end of the run. It's more important for us to watch all the blocking that occurred, all right? Um, side judge, field judge, goal line, and sideline cleanup, okay? So once that once the ball carry goes into, into the bench area, okay, either on his, his own sideline or the opposite sideline, there's going to be opponents there. Deep wings, we are in there to clean up, okay? Questions so far? Do we have any in the chat, uh, Jeremy? Nope, you're good. Okay. So, all right, onside kick. Um, now, we, we talked about proper positioning, okay? We all have to be aware. Um, you, you should be prepared for an onside kick every single play, whether it happens or not. How many times have we worked games at any level where the, the kicking team uh, decides they're going to just do an onside kick and we're, and we're caught off guard? Always be prepared for an onside kick, all right? Now, if we know is a situation where a team just scored and they're down by one score and there's a minute left in the game, they're probably going to uh, attempt an onside kick. We want to bring our, our H and L up to the 45-yard line, all right, for extra, um, extra eyes on blocking and touching and stuff like that, all right? It looks more crowded than it is, all right? Let the ball go 10 yards, all right? Referee, you can stay on the goal line. You can move up, all right? Because now if we have a, the referee, your, your job now is to determine if we have a kick, um, you know, that, that maybe goes into the air and they, they didn't hit it right. And now we have a, a receiving team player near it and he gets blown up. You might be in best position to see that. All right, free kicks after a fair catch. I've never seen it in any of my games, um, but I've seen it. I've seen film. So we'd line up um, just the way we would on a regular free kick. And referee, you are uh, responsible for the whether the ball goes through the goalpost or, or H and L. H and L are okay. Got it. Again, I've never seen it. You may never see it in your entire career but it's, it's possible. Question so far about free kicks. Again, remember, just remember the important points. Blocks, blocks, blocks. Okay, and stay on the goal line. All right, Mike. There okay. was, hang on real quick. There was one NCAA changed the umpire and free kicks to be in the press box side. Are we going with that? Um, I'm not aware that uh, uh, NFHS made any changes in regards to free, uh, free, free kicks for the upcoming season. Yeah, I would, unless Robbie says any different, I would go with what, um, what we have listed here. Correct. Okay. All right. Let's talk a little bit about uh, scrimmage plays. The majority of what we're going to see um, in, on our, in our games and 11 on 11, Referee, headlinesman, line judge, umpire, standard positioning, where we really need to work, because um, we see a lot of variation in this when we watch film, is where our deep wings are. And I think a lot of it could just be uh, people unfamiliar with the position, maybe getting scheduled to go work that position for the first time. Um, very first thing to do is to look the part, and that is making sure that as a deep wing, you're lining up at the correct place. Uh, so you'll see here, field judge, side judge, back judge will always line up on a major yard line. Uh, back judge, as you will see, will always be five yards deeper than the side judge or field judge. 
field judge and side judge should be 22 to 25 yards from uh, their short wings. Get yourself a cushion so that you're not caught off guard um, because it's, you know, very few of us are faster than the players out there. And any of us that have worked that deep wing position, you know that they can they they can get to you very quickly. So make sure you've built yourself a buffer. Don't try to sneak up because they've been running the ball a lot um, because that's when you'll you'll get burned on those deep passes. So deep wings, 22 to 25 yards, back judge five yards beyond that. A good best practice for the deep wings and the back judge, call out your yardage pre-snap. When you're doing your counts, say, you know, I'm on the 40 yard line, back judge 35. Call that out, get that into a repetition. That way everyone's lined up in the proper place. Pre-snap duties, going to be very similar to what we do now. Line judge, umpire, referee, head linesman, you're going to count the offense. Field judge, back judge, side judge, you're going to count your defense. Make sure you're given proper signals. National Federation mechanic, your arm extended out um, so that everyone can communicate. Be talking if you've got uh, less than 11 or more than 11. Inside the 25 yard line. This is uh, really important because it will make sure that we're in the proper position to be able to rule on any, on any type of scoring play. So if we're inside the 25 yard line, we're going to have headlinesman, line judge in their positions, field judge, side judge will have goal line responsibility. The back judge will be on the end line. Now this is from the 25 yard line and in. So again, hit your radios based on where the ball is spotted. So we're at the 25, we're at the 25, we're at the 24, 23, et cetera help your deep wings know what their position is. And as always, headlinesman, line judge have all forward progress to the two yard line. Side judge and field judge will have goal line uh, and spots inside the two yard line. You'll see a lot of times, especially those that are unfamiliar with the deep wing position, they'll run up to the four yard line to spot the ball on a pass. It's okay to hang back, make note of the spot, let your short wing work up to that position. Even if you want to hit the radio and say it's going to be four yard line, four yard line, four yard line, give your short wing uh, as much information as possible as they're running up to that position. Back judge will be on the end line, field judge, side judge at the pylon. And if any, anybody's watched, especially the college game, uh, I can't recommend this enough. Don't stand directly on the pylon. Give yourself a buffer, three yards off the pylon. Give yourself an area that you're not close to the sideline so that you have a good view of the feet of the receivers, the hands, um, to where you can make a, a, a really good observation. And Scott, you're more familiar with the college game. Can you just elaborate a little bit more on why Wings are instructed, especially those deep wings on the pylon, they they back off the pylon to get a better view. Can you just elaborate a little bit on that? Yeah, it's not just the deep wings, it's it's the short wings as well, especially um near the obviously when we're when we get to the goal line on the snap. Think about how many plays when they come your way, they go straight to the pylon with a diving uh runner and everything that comes with him, right? The last thing you want to do is get a you don't want it's unsafe you don't want to get rolled up okay and the wider the the further you are away from a play the better the, the more you can see maybe not the exactly uh someone stepping on the sideline fortunately in the seven person we have the short wings to help us with uh, whether or not a runner is is on the sideline but certainly you want to get back to see um to, to get a better better view uh, of of the players and to save your you know, to save your skin in case you get uh, you don't want to get uh, hit by some of these players. Yeah, so try to work in that buffer three yards off the pylon. Give yourself a view so you can see out in front. You can see the pylon, even see a little bit beyond if that's where the pass would would be to potentially take. Uh, and Mike, Mike, on that note, sorry to inject. When you're yeah. going, when you're when we're in pregame and we're walking the field. Are, we should bring those those G markers back as far as we can, just so we have when we're not tripping on them uh, during the game. Yep, when you're walking the field. 
So as we're approaching the goal line, seven yard to goal line, proper positioning. So once we've hit the seven yard line, field judge, back judge, side judge will now work back to the back pylon. Line judge, head linesman, you have goal line responsibilities. Uh, so you'll read the play from the seven yard line, take initial positions on the line of scrimmage, side judge, field judge, take initial positions on the end line. As the play progresses, work to the goal line. Um, it's not an immediate move to the goal line, but line judge, head linesman, you have to know that that is your responsibility. So be sure to start working your way there, but don't take, your posi don't take yourself out of position to rule on uh, the play. Um, Mike, real quick, I'm sorry. Yeah. Uh, on that note, you should be, once, you, once the deeps go or, or, all three on the end line, you should be commuting, communicating to your downfield partner, your goal line, my goal line, I'm on the end line. In fact, you should be communicating to somebody before and after every play. Absolutely. Um, just some responsibilities. And again, this is all very, you know, we don't need to get into this um, in depth. Referees, normal position responsible for direction of pass for backwards signal only after all positive requirements have been met for a score. Umpire, normal scrimmage play responsibilities. I can't stress this enough as an umpire, do not signal touchdown. There's really no situation where our umpires should ever be signaling touchdown. Let the wing, deep wings rule if a score has been made. Headlines been line judge. Your goal line responsibilities are from the seven yard line in. Be at the goal line, communicate on every play with your downfield official, let them know when you will assume responsibility for ruling on goal line plays, only signal if you see the ball cross the goal line, never mirror signals. Um, field judge, side judge, when the ball, uh, as we said, snapped outside the 25 yard line, assume normal positions. When the ball is from the 25 to the seven, you're on the goal line from the seven yard line uh, in, you're on the end line. Back judge, normal position on ball snapped outside the 25 yard line. Um, and again, uh, you have primary end line coverage when the offense is in uh, tight power run, for example, you're looking for low blocks. Um, so back to just really somewhat of a normal position on, on what you're doing. And we'll take a look at individual responsibilities um, here in, in a moment. Also used in the field of play for teams going on fourth down the line to gain would be the goal line. And again, that's basic mechanics from uh, five and seven man. Reverse goal line in the event that you have a fumble, you have an interception uh, potentially going um, the other way. Or excuse me, first, let me start. Reverse goal line mechanics. Anytime we're on the three yard line, uh, headlines been line judge, move to the goal line immediately at the snap. Work your way back out at that point, read the play. But if we're on the three yard line or in, Headlinesman, line judge, start on the line of scrimmage, work directly back to the goal line, read the play, uh, and then begin to work normally as the play unfolds. Um, reverse goal, goal line, line is the money line, guys. The money yes, line. That's the only line that matters. So if nobody's there to officiate it, okay, if we're if we're trying to go downfield to, to beat a, a runner and we're not focused on, on the important lines, we're going to miss something. Absolutely. Reverse goal line mechanics from the three to the 10 yard line. Again, uh, line judge will hold the line of scrimmage. Headlinesman read the play and move to the goal line if appropriate. If it feels like the goal line is going to be threatened, the headlinesman get to that spot. Line judge, you will hold the line of scrimmage to be able to rule um, on the event that we have uh, an elite, potentially an illegal forward pass, um, help the umpire with uh, linemen downfield potentially. The beauty of the seven man mechanic is it provides what we call collapsing box coverage. And what I mean by that is field judge, side judge, back judge, your initial key should always be to read your key and kind of like an outfielder in baseball, your first step back, potentially, assuming you're going to have to move backwards, you're going to be moving uh, potentially backwards at the snap, always make sure your sidelines are clear because you may not see who's directly behind you. Once the play is unfolded, read the play, read your key, and be prepared to act. And what I say by that is if you have a run up the middle, short wings, you'll move to the spot. Side judge, field judge, back judge, you're going to now box in. Uh, headlinesman, line judge will have the spot on the line of scrimmage. 
our field judge, back judge, side judge will work what we call the accordion principle. And that is getting between players, dead ball officiating, breaking up confrontations, making a presence. We should all be moving in in this accordion fashion whenever we've got um, a play in the middle of the game field there. Um, really, at the very least, just to make your presence known. Yeah, if, Mike, if, um, if I may. Yeah, line, to, line of scrimmage officials, we don't want you coming in unless you have to get a spot toward the middle of the field. We don't want you coming in too far. A few steps, as long as the umpire can see your foot, right? Obviously, if it's third, fourth down or goal line and, and it's a critical spot, we want you busting in. Um, but we want to save our energy, right? We, we want to keep all the players in our, in our view. And on, in the context of the accordion, your, your downfield deep wing should only come in as far as you go. So if you're busting into the hash mark at every play, you're going to wear out your deep wings or also have to do that. Okay. Does that make sense? Good. Umpire, just a good best practice. You don't have to be in a hurry to get the ball unless the, the situation dictates it. Under two minutes, clock running, offense trying to move the score. Um, a lot of umpires run up to the ball in both five and seven man mechanics and they miss potentially things around them. So umpire, don't be in the necessary rush to get the ball, clear your area, get to the ball, move with purpose, get the ball spotted, and then be prepared for our next play. When we got a long run down the sideline, as the play unfolds, side judge, back judge, uh, field judge, read the play back up when threatened, keep the play boxed in. As the run moves down the sideline, uh, again, side judge, field judge, that is not your spot. Headlinesman, line judge will have all spots up to the two-yard line. Be prepared when you have a long run down the sideline, uh, deep wing, to work your way back up to help clean up. So in this situation, your headlinesman is going to get to the spot, and it's going to be up to the side judge to then get into the out-of-bounds area separate the players, potentially retrieve the ball, get them back to their sides of the field. And on that note, on, on a long run, the philosophy on, on the lack of importance of a spot on a long run, on a kick, on, on a punt return, on, on a turnover, the spot is the least important thing, all right? The most important thing is player management, okay? So if, if, if you tell the... If, the, if it's a long run down the near sideline, side judge, you're near the goal line and the run ends at the eight and it's really the seven, you tell the H, oh, it's at the, it's at the, the eight. Nobody cares if we're a yard off. It's first and goal either way, right? It's more important to manage the blocking and the player conduct after, afterward, okay? So don't be so concerned with having to get, get that spot. We'll get it. As long as it's close, we'll be okay. Yeah, and especially when you're new at this, you haven't done it, don't overrun your uh, partner there. Headlinesman, don't overrun the side judge, side judge, field judge. You should be backed up enough to where you can box in where the end of the run would be. Don't overrun each other. It does not look good. Plus, you could run the potential of bumping into each other and potentially getting injured. So as we see here, this play unfolds. The headlinesman is working up to their position. And now ball crosses the goal line. Headlinesman stop at the two-yard line and let the side judge rule on the play. Yeah. This is it's an awkward mechanic. And we can we can go over this PowerPoint, you know, till we're blue in the face. There's no substitute for getting the snaps to get actually getting live snaps. So that's why I encourage our uh, associations to do that at some point in the season. So now we're going to talk about keys in seven man mechanics. And this takes a lot of work and a lot of memory and a lot of communication. And um, we're not going to be able to really get into every single um, opportunity that's out there, but this really is where radios can be a big factor on your crew because those wings can communicate with one another as to what responsibilities they have if they're unsure um, we see here in a pro set where we've got uh, a tight end um, to the left side, uh, one receiver each, two backs, 
in this situation, the deep wings have the widest receivers. Back judge then has the second widest, which in this case would be the tight end. Line judge has one of the backs. Headlinesman would have the other back. So theoretically, we have all of our keys covered. Now, in a perfect world, they'd be in the same formation every time, and it'd be very easy. Uh, that's not always the case. We know in seven-man mechanics, umpire, you have responsibility for guard, center, guard. You're, the ball in pre-snap is your primary responsibility. You want to make sure we don't have any form of an illegal snap, especially as we get into the deeper into the season, we get into the playoffs. These centers should have been talked to if they're taking the balls and they're spinning them end to end if they're extending the ball out too far to gain an advantage, like that should all be corrected in the first couple of weeks, especially if you've got someone playing football for the first time, they may not know that that's great preventative officiating, um, but umpires be on top of the football from the start. That's your key responsibility pre-snap. And then you've got your guard center guard referee. You're going to have the tackles um, opposite you and closest to you because of your field of vision. Um, some referees do this differently. This would be a pregame discussion. Some referees prefer the tackle closest to them. Some referees prefer the tackle opposite of them because of uh, the angle of vision. This is a discussion for pregame. Double wing. We do have some teams here in Pinellas County, for example, that run this double wing formation. And so here again, field judge and side judge will have the deep or the, the widest receivers. The back judge at this point is going to take uh, the second widest receiver. Line judge will have the back and the head linesman will have the wing to, um, to their side. Again, this is where radio can come in. If, if you're unsure as a back judge which side you're taking, you can call out the number. That way the line judge knows if he has that individual or if he has the back or if the head linesman would have it. This is where the radios can, can save you. Trips formations. Again, field judge in this situation has the widest receiver. Side judge has the widest receiver. Line judge has closest receiver to the inside of the line. Head linesman has the receiver inside from their end, and the back judge would have um, the second widest receiver here. In a stacked formation, we have no formal keys because they're all at the same distance. So this is where you get on the radio and the line judge says, I'm gonna take the front number 81, field judge, you've got the second one, back judge, you've got the third one potentially. Um, this is tricky. There's five receivers potentially, and there's five of us, but they're all gonna be moving at the same time. Hit your radios, talk to one another. Now it's real easy to look at this on this presentation and know who we have um, just to give everyone a best practice or not so much a best practice, but if you can do this work with your local associations, all of the local high schools are doing seven on seven tournaments. They do seven on seven practices. There's a lot of that that is out there right now. Um, schedule a Saturday for your association to go out and work a seven on seven tournament or uh, practice that a team may be doing. That is the absolute best way to work your keys, to learn your keys. Put seven individuals out, rotate around, work on who should have who, what, what happens if you have that man in motion. Um, it's really easy to talk about it here, but as Scott said, unless you get out and you take snaps, um, that's the best real world practice you can get. So find some seven on sevens, like I said, I follow a lot of the local high schools on Twitter. They're constantly uh, doing seven on seven practices or meeting up with another school and doing something informal. If you have some guys that can get out there, this is the, the absolute best way to learn uh, these formations. Yeah, hey, the Michael, reason... real quick, before yes. we move on, there was a question on, on uh, the back judge and their positioning on us. Uh, does, does the back judge stay on the goal line for a score. If the, if I guess it would all dictate on where they started. So um, if the, if the goal line is their responsibility, yes. If they've moved to the back line, 
um, and they uh, the goal line is going to be threatened. Um, I I don't know that we would necessarily want them moving up. Scott, what are your thoughts? No, no. They, if you start they, in the end. If you start in the end line, you stay in the end line. Yeah, but if the back judge has goal line responsibility, which they do, so if they say they start on the five yard line and the play dictates it, they can back up. I mean, we'd rather have them on the hard line than versus floating around in the middle of the end zone. So, but right. um, definitely don't want you on the end line coming up to the goal line to rule, let your deep wings uh, if they're in that position or the short wings at that point, Scott, anything you'd add to that? Yeah, you're going to have the deep wings are primarily responsible for the goal line. So in a long run, you know, it's going to be side judge, field judge, where it gets where where the back judge will have to adjust is on a pass um, when the back judge does not start on the end line but still has end line responsibilities. Okay, so that pass that goes, you know, maybe five yards into the end zone, and the back judge maybe started on the goal line or or is having to um, you know run downfield for a long pass. You just you got to be cognizant of both lines. Okay, so other than that, you shouldn't have to do much movement to to get to a goal line on a on a play like that. So there was clarification. It was uh, he was asking about it for on a long run or passing uh, scoring play. Yeah, well, all all three should be should be at the all three deep should be at the goal line on a long a long running play. Any other questions, Jeremy? Are we free to move on? You're free to move on. Okay. Uh, just some discussion topics. Again, we won't get into a lot of these. These should be very familiar with what you do in five-man mechanics. Dead ball spot. Officials use sharp 90-degree angles. It, um, we still see some some guys that cheat their um, that that cheat their uh, points. Um, don't run in at a at an angle. Come in at your 90-degree angle. Box it off. It just looks better. Concentrate on your keys and your points of attack, free blocking zone, false starts, whistles are what shut down the play. We can be signaling to kill the clock, but the players aren't going to stop until we hear the whistle. And we tell them, play till you hear the whistle. Hurry up offenses. We see this a lot. The players are getting faster. And unfortunately, as some of us are getting older in age, we're getting slower. We want to accommodate what the teams want to do. Um, but they really can't go any faster than what we can do. Um, and I've personally seen, you know, going out and doing evaluations and watching um, uh, some officials and referees, they want to go fast because that's what the offense wants to do. But don't go too fast to where you're not giving your chain crews, who are not the most agile people, a chance to get set or to get your other officials on the field set. You can move with a purpose. We can move fast, um, but uh, make sure that we're not sacrificing our counts and our mechanics to help an offense go fast. Um, and that's always a question I ask a referee as a referee in pregame. Coach, do you run any type of hurry up? Yeah, we're yeah we're gonna we're gonna go fast. So I hope you guys are ready. Okay, coach, I appreciate that. We're gonna go fast too, but we're gonna go at the pace to where I can make sure that my chain crews where they need to be and my officials are where they need to be. We're going to try to let you go as fast as we can, but we can't jeopardize the integrity of what we need to do in the name of getting your, your players to move fast. And this is really where the umpire makes a big difference. I recommend all umpires find out the numbers of your centers in pregame, go find them during that pregame conversation, introduce yourself, tell that center, listen, you and I are going to work together. I'm going to spot the ball. I'll tell you if you can go. I'll tell you if you need to hold up. I'll use these are my hand signals. I'll hold my palm up if we need to wait. If I put the ball down, I back up. I'm not holding you up. You're good to go, especially since we we aren't chopping it in uh, with the, the play clock. Um, the umpire can really do a lot of that communicating and make that happen. If we have multiple flags, take your time to get it right. Everyone should be communicating the who, what, when, where, and why. Jeremy, do we have another question? No, he was just saying thank you for, for answering. Okay. Mike, can I just say something about keys? Yeah. So the reason, the re 
in seven person mechanics, it is crucial to know who your keys are and to stay with, with that player. Because the last thing you want to have happen is your, your key or your key's opponent is on the ground and you don't know how that player got there. Okay. Um, so it's important to know your keys and stay with your keys until they're no longer a threat or they're no longer in your area. And that comes with that just comes with snaps. Yeah. So I know we're, we're getting ready to uh, run out of time. I just want to talk a little bit about reverse mechanics and punts real quick. Reverse mechanics, uh, we're basically taking the same principles we've talked about all night and reversing them. If you have a, on a punt, on a fumble, interception, uh, field judge and side judge, you've got forward progress now down to that two-yard line. Line judge, head linesman, uh, you've got two-yard two yard line to goal line. Uh, and referee, you're going to have end line responsibility now. So you'll be back ruling uh, on the goal line. As the play works back, um, <clears throat> The field judge and side judge are the trailing official, line judge, head linesman are the leading official. And again, we work the same premise. Um, line judge, head linesman, assume goal line position, field judge, side judge, you'll work back. Referee shares goal line duty. Don't get beat, especially on a reverse mechanic, because there may not be anybody there to potentially cover the goal line. Ref, if I may, referees, when there is a change of possession, when you have a punt, and a punt return, you must, must, must watch the passer and that kicker because you know that those are the ones that are going to be targeted by the intercepting team, the receiving team uh, on those reverse mechanics. So be, be cognizant of that. And just to uh, touch on punt mechanics in our seven man configuration, here, when we're at, uh, at the 50 yard line and out, so when we say out, meaning more than 50 yards, um, headlinesman, line judge, umpire, normal positioning, umpire really should be 10 yards back uh, in avoiding the, the bull rush coming their way. Um, field judge, side judge, back judge, you're, you're all going to stand on the closest major yard line. And this is where you're going to now box in your keys. And this is a really good diagram to show. Field judge is going to have from the goal line out, pretty much out to the hash. Side judge, same thing. Back judge will have uh, the re receiving player in the middle of the field. Umpire will be watching the clean up in the middle. And then line judge and headlinesman, same thing. From the 50-yard line in, back judge, side judge, field judge, you're on the goal line so that you can rule if the ball reaches the goal line. There's never going to be a situation on a punt where you'll have it, uh, you'll be back on the end line. You will always anchor the goal line to be able to rule. And again, you're going to work your areas of the field. Um, punt mechanics are really no different for referees, umpires, headlinesmen, line judge, count the offense, know who your eligible receivers are. We see a lot of this, and this is really critical, especially for the umpire as well know who the eligible receivers are because we don't have numbering restrictions on uh, a fourth down punt. So you've got a wide variety of numbers and you can go out on YouTube and find pictures and videos where the center sneaks out and catches a pass on a blown up punt. That individual was not in an eligible position, but they had an eligible number and the crews miss it. Um, it's a great best practice on punts, just like we do on field goals, call out your eligible numbers so that if the play blows up, you know who those individuals will be. Field judge, side judge, back judge, count your R players and signal position yourselves 10 to 12 yards behind the deepest receiver. Don't be right up with that deepest receiver. Position yourself 10 to 12 yards back. Observe the people running down the field. Watch the gunners, as Scott talked about earlier. A lot of things can go haywire when those gunners are running down the sidelines. Um, keep an eye on those gunners. Back judge, We'll always have that initial position between the hash marks eight to 10 yards deeper than the deepest receiver. Um, count the R players be in position to rule on the validity of the catch or the signal. Back judge has primary coverage on the receiver, the ball, and the signal until the action advances to the point of attack. Um, these are great discussion topics for your pregames. Who are your eligible R receivers in the case of a fake kick? What do we do in a kick out of bounds? If we have a handoff or a reverse forward or potentially block kicks, spot where the kick ends at the goal line, what do we do if the ball's batted? Do we have roughing or running into the kicker? What dictates the difference between the two? 
fair catch signals. Back judges, you should be reminding your receivers every single time they come out to give you a good fair catch signal. Post scrimmage kick spot, illegal blocks below the waist. What do we do if a scrimmage kick fails to cross the neutral zone? Um, coaches don't know this rule. Players don't know this rule. And if that kick is blocked and it's picked up, they could throw it. They could try to kick it again. They could run it. So be prepared for either or any of those situations and what the actual ruling is. I had one last year where we handled it correctly. Um, coach didn't understand the rule and we had to walk them through and explain it because they, uh, they don't understand what happens if the kick falls behind the neutral zone and it's picked up. For field goals, again, very similar. Mike, sorry, one more thing. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, don't forget momentum. Don't forget momentum. Have your beanbag out and ready to rule on momentum or rule on your spots. And to wrap us up, uh, field goal mechanics, field judge and back judge will have uh, will rule on um, whether or not the ball is over the upright, through the bar, et cetera. Line judge and head linesman, you have line of scrimmage. Referee will be looking in to the holder, uh, snapper, kicker. Umpire and side judge, this is where your mechanics come into play. Umpire, you'll split your side to the left. Side judge, you'll split your side to the right. Count your players. Again, umpire, you have main responsibility for the ball. It's okay to sneak over a little bit to get ahead of the ball, so you've got a clear view. Always make sure you got a clear view of the ball. In the event we have a swinging gate, I won't cover it here. Go, you can come in and take a look, but it just kind of breaks down what to do in the event that we have that so that we can position ourselves accordingly. Um, and then we have measurements. Again, pretty straightforward. This is right out of the mechanics manual. Back judge will have the ball. Field judge, you'll have the, the uh, you'll clear the, the players away and you'll secure a new ball if we have to move it within the hash marks. Line judge will have the spot on the line. Side judge takes charge of the box. Headlinesman will bring the chain out, and then referee will be in position to pull the chain. Refer or the umpire, excuse me, and then the referee will rule uh, on the actual spot. And again, review these mechanics um, uh, as part of your pregame. And again, this is just the best practice for your associations. Go out on a night during the week, especially when the teams come back in to start practicing. Uh, and just do a training session out of the school for measurement mechanics. You can spend a whole evening talking about measurements and five-man mechanics and seven-man mechanics. Uh, these are all located in the officials manual that the National Federation puts out, um, but make sure that you review these uh, as well. And then penalty enforcement is pretty straightforward. Again, um, the only big difference here is um, everybody kind of plays a part, and um, we want to make sure that we're marching the penalties off correctly, that the headlinesman and umpire are going to the proper spot, the line judge holding the spot from where the penalty was enforced um, as the referee makes a signal. In this situation, we have an offensive holding. Um, all three should line up at the same yard line with the same down. Um, but again, go into your official's manual, read about penalty enforcement, um, cause you, again, you can spend a whole evening, um, talking about that, Scott, this really ends our presentation. So I want to stop, see if we have any more questions, Jeremy, and then, um, Scott, any final thoughts from you? Um, I don't have any, uh, other questions that have come up, but as, uh, Scott kind of says his parting words, um, as we're kind of chatting here, if anyone does have any questions though, I would, uh, encourage you to, to ask them and, and, uh, get those answers before we leave uh, tonight. Obviously, if something comes out um, after the the webinar um, during the summer throughout the season, please reach out uh, to myself, uh, Robbie. Um, and, and if we don't know it or we don't have that exact answer, we know we have resources such as Michael and Scott that we can reach out to as well um, to make sure we are uh, keeping everybody on the same page. Um, that is one of the biggest complaints or gripes that we hear. Um, from school is throughout the season, they go to um, one area to the other area to the next area. Um, and they see three different things uh, um, on what they feel is the same call. So um, hopefully uh, everybody uh, receiving the seven uh, person mechanics kind of helps ease that 
um, it, it, and we can all kind of start becoming uh, being on the same page. So again, Michael Scott, we appreciate it. Um, if if anything comes up, I'll I'll uh, ask uh, before we head out. But Scott, I'll turn it over to you for any final words that you might have. Yeah, thanks, Jeremy. I'm I'm fine. If you want to publish, you know, my contact information, you have all that. I'm always happy to, to field questions. Um, I can't speak for Mike, but uh, I know he likes to have uh, conversations with people, so it might be the case. But uh, I just encourage everybody to, all the associations to at least work some games, especially if you're going to designate your top crews, um, work some seven person games. We've incorporated that into SFOA this year. Um, and there are opportunities to do so. I mean, not everybody, not every, every association has you know, as many teams as, let's say, NFOA. On any given night, NFOA in Jacksonville is sending out 20, anywhere from 20 to 26 five-person crews. Um, but on the slower weeks, you have that marquee matchup that maybe you want a few more sets of eyes on. It's, it would be extremely helpful to start, to start doing that, incorporating the seven-person mechanics to the extent you need some training on it. Um, and a shameless plug for my camp, my partner, Andrew McGrath and I uh, run a camp that's located in Florida and we have people that could come out and help train your association. So uh, utilize the time, utilize the opportunities to learn this. The first time you work seven person mechanics, you don't want that to be week one of the playoffs. Yeah. Um, it I was just going to say uh, real quick too, if, um, and it gets sent out towards the end of the season. I know Jeremy and Robbie have sent it out in the past, but if um, there's also kind of a cheat sheet uh, that is really helpful in pregame, obviously you can't take this presentation unless you bring your iPad, your laptop. Um, there's a really good cheat sheet as well for these seven man mechanics, which outlines everyone's responsibility in every different situation, whether it's penalty enforcement, coin toss, kickoff, um, that's a great tool to bring to the pregame. I know when my crew does seven man, uh, we meet during the week to discuss it. And then we review it again in person at the game site as we're getting dressed to talk about it. Um, so uh, that'll be, I believe that's out on the central hub as well. And then this presentation, um, Jeremy's going to post out there for us as well. So use it, utilize it. As Scott said, be happy to talk with anyone about any questions they may have. Thank you. And, and on, on uh, in regards to that cheat sheet, is it is actually down right now. Um, some of the years were outdated, so we just want to kind of update that. Uh, I'm going to get with with the gentleman who worked on this just to make sure there isn't anything that needs to be changed on the cheat sheet. Um, but that is down right now. But like like Michael said, it will be posted. Um, I did post the actual PowerPoint. Um, already on Central Hub as Scott and Michael were going through their presentation. So that is already on the Central Hub. Um, and then the webinar will take me a little more time probably by the end of the day tomorrow um, as I have to download it and then and put it into YouTube and get the links and things like that. So um, that takes a little bit more time, but I do have a couple of questions or uh, I guess maybe a comment and a question. Um, can you remind crews about the holding behind the line of scrimmage uh, rule change that just took place for this year? Uh, yeah, so great call out. Uh, that's probably the big takeaway. And, and hopefully all of your associations are having um, a meeting with with coaches um, in preseason. Uh, I know we do. We bring all the coaches together. Not all of them come, but we invite them all to a central location to talk about rule changes and uniforms and all the stuff we always have to talk about. But um, that's the big one this year. Um, and the primary place you'll see it is if you have a hold behind the line of scrimmage, it used to be a spot foul. Now it's going to go back to the previous spot. If you had a tackle that held a player uh, defense uh, and a um, uh, defensive player seven yards in the backfield, now all of a sudden you're seven yards where the penalty occurred back and now you're adding 10. So all of a sudden the next play starts 17 yards back. Those penalties now go back to the previous spot. That's the big rule change for this year. Um, if you haven't seen those rule changes yet, um, go to the National Federation website. They've got a PowerPoint out with them. They've got um, their, their uh, key points of emphasis up. So I would highly encourage everyone to do that. But yes, um, that's the big change this year. Holding now um, will be from the previous spot or any penalty behind the line of scrimmage that would warrant that will be from the previous spot, not um, the spot of the foul.
And, and as he mentioned the PowerPoint, I have sent that out um, when, when we got that as well. However, if you don't have it or need it again, um, please let us know and, and we can get that um, over to you again um, as we have it in our Google Doc uh, folder. So that's not a problem. Um, another question, will the coaches have access to this PowerPoint for seven man mechanics? We can definitely get this out to our coaches. Um, obviously Robbie has all those contacts, so uh, I can make that request uh, to him. Um, and, and that shouldn't be a problem as we can uh, post that into home campus for them. Um, is holding in the end zone still a safety? Yes, yes. It is. yeah, that yes. that's not going to change. It's only if the pre if the penalty occurred. Anytime you have that penalty in the end zone, that did not change. So those... this Mike Hayden guy is really on the ball. Yes. <laughs> all right. Well, that's all I have, gentlemen. Uh, again, like I said, I appreciate um, you taking out uh, an hour and about fifteen minutes of your evening this eve uh, tonight for us, um, going through this PowerPoint. Um, appreciate all of you who joined us. We had about 135, I think we topped out. So um, a lot of you uh, joining us tonight. Thank you. We appreciate that. Uh, and like I said, um, the PowerPoint is already posted. Uh, the webinar will be posted by the end of the day tomorrow. Um, and we do have one, uh, another webinar scheduled for July 26th, um, working with the association now. So uh, more information and the uh, link to be able to register for that webinar will be coming out uh, probably by the end of next week. Um, so be on the lookout for that. All right. Well, thank you uh, everyone for thank attending. You, Appreciate it. And um, I look forward to seeing you next time.